as, as a Spanish character. Yeah. What's your favorite line you said in all of your voice acting? Uh, James from the movie with the unknown. When the stuff is floating around and he says, I haven't seen this many strange letters since I placed that personal ad. <laughs> which was genius. Now, back in the day, the writers that were working on that show were like the A-team of writers, some of the funniest people I've ever worked with. So as much as it was the way we acted the lines and said the lines, we also had great lines to say. So um, not to take away from, you know, oh, it was a great performance, I was funny, but I was funny because I had, I had a great writer giving me funny words to say. Um, and that was, of course, a joke that was designed for, um, well, let me go back a little bit. Profanity and toilet humor is funny, but it's easy. It's a cop-out. Cursing and stuff like that to pepper in to a joke that's not funny to make it funnier, that's easy. The greatest comedians can find ways to make you laugh with double entendres and funny jokes that you go, oh, and you get the double meaning. So in this case, we knew that Mom and Dad had to drag, had to be dragged to the movies with you to see Pokemon, right? Yeah. They weren't like, the new Pokemon's out, I can't wait to go. <laughs> I got advanced tickets front row, we got the whole, they're, they're like, oh, not again, right? I had to convince my parents right? to see the movie. So we thought if we put in jokes that you would laugh because James just said something, but they would laugh because it went over your head, but it wasn't so dirty that it was offensive. They knew you didn't get that joke. They knew that stuff was not for you, it was for them. So to me, that was a very smart way to do it because I've had many adults come up to me and say, James was hands down my favorite character. He made me laugh. When I had to watch Pokemon with my kids, I was laughing at Team Rocket all the time. And there was a lot of jokes in there that were meant for the adults, but were ne never crossed the line of being dirty. They were just clever. So that's why the writers then were really, really great. So good question. Yeah. Um, I was just curious. Now I know from your podcast, uh, you became a musician before you became a voice actor. Mm -hmm. um, had those two not fallen through, did you have like a backup career <laughs> in mind at all? A backup career. I don't even think I ever, ever had like another path in mind at all. Um, to give you an example of sort of my focus as a, as a person. When I was in nursery school, or first year, maybe it was first year of kindergarten, my mother came to pick me up on the first day, and everyone was sitting, and she came a little early, and everyone was sitting around the teacher for reading time, story time, and I was in the back of the room playing with Lego by myself. And after the class ended, my mother came up to the teacher and said, can I ask why my son was not involved, like, and she thought it was a bad thing, why my son was not part of the rest of the class. And the teacher said, we both feel this is the best way to handle this, meaning me and the teacher. Because it wasn't that I wanted to be a rebel, and I was a slacker. If I did things my own way, I did them, and I worked hard doing them. But I always had, no, it doesn't always have to be this. And I still believe that as a person. There is no one path. The path is you work hard at what you love to do. And also the path is, to me, success is the journey, not the pot of gold. You can't be, oh man, I didn't get that role, or I wish I had you know, uh, played that big show, or oh, man, it would have been great to have won the lottery that day. Whatever it is, it has to be Wow, that was a great experience. This was a fun journey. And so, as long as you're working hard at something, then that's an okay path. I remember, you know, I, I went to college for one year and I left school because, um, one, my English teacher said, what are you doing here? Um, you're much too creative to be at this particular school, which I thought was very ballsy of her. I appreciated that. Um, but I left there to work as a film PA on movie shoots and stuff like that so that I could pursue music. I needed to find a way to make money so that I could pursue music because I knew what I wanted to do. And I remember my dad saying to my mom, hey, he doesn't call home and ask for money, he's not in jail, and he works hard at what he wants to do. That's successful to me. I don't have a problem with that. 
And, and I think that we miss that a little bit. You know, our parents, at least my parents, uh, my mother's a dancer. She was, you know, she chose to teach as a dancer because the fear of how am I going to pay my bills as a professional dancer was too much. Um, and so she has a fear of her son being in the arts. But she also knows, like, okay, you work hard doing what you do. You love what you do. It, it, that's my fear that I'm projecting on you. Um, so I didn't have a fallback plan. Um, I knew from eighth grade that I wanted to play music. I wanted to be an entertainer. I wanted to play music. I loved the stage. I loved live performance. Um, and I found ways to, to earn a living to support that. So, yeah, I don't know what I would be. You know, I can't travel very far without having a guitar near me. Because um, I have to write. Even if I don't have a show, I need to write. Um, and, uh, yeah, man, what would I do? Well, I used to be a tennis pro for a little while, but then I, my, I have a bad shoulder, so I can't do that anymore. Um, and there wasn't really, you know, I wasn't going to be the tennis pro. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I would do. Maybe I would teach. I, I don't know. You know, I, I, I always knew I wanted to do what I want to do, but not voice act. That just, that was the thing that I stumbled into. But uh, if you've got a passion that you really believe in and you work hard at doing it, do it. And don't let someone tell you you can't do it. As a New York working actor, if someone had said to me, you want to be a voice actor in New York City? Good luck to you. And I never tried it. If everyone listened to people who said don't do it, there would be no actors. But I was a very successful actor in New York City with a lot of competition. Now I live in Nashville as a singer-songwriter. The same thing. You're going to Nashville to be a musician? Good luck. There's so many of them. Well, you, you can't tell people that. They're projecting their own fear on you or their jealousy that you are going to make those choices. You know, There's nothing less helpful than a, a jealous person telling you, you don't want to do that, you know, as if they're coming from you know, a friend. But yeah, I don't know. I'm going to have to think about what my backup plan is going to be because I'm still, you know, I'm still like a big kid. So there you go, I'm just in an old man's body. All right, who's got another question? Yes. Lovely hat, by the way. Um, what was your favorite part to voice act and your least favorite part and why? My favorite part? That's tough because there's a lot of fun characters that I've played and there's been a lot of fun uh, moments with those characters. I like the comedy of James from Team Rocket. I like the, the distracted by shiny objects of Brock where they'll be in an intense scene and all of a sudden a pretty girl comes and he's just more, you know, interested <laughs> in that. Um, that's always a lot of fun. Um, uh, if you guys have ever seen in Pokemon, a lot of times Misty will grab me by the ear or grab Brock and pull me off camera. So I added an ad lib that I had to stick in every episode I could possibly do, which was I would just go, not the ear, right? I would say not the ear as Brock. And sometimes there'd be enough room because you didn't want to do it when the mouth wasn't moving. There'd be enough room to do it as a quick blur or she'd pull me off camera so fast that I'd sometimes sneak it in on the next scene as if it was being yelled from across a river or something like that. <laughs> it just had to be stuck into the, into the show. So that was always a fun little like you know Easter egg like special uh, thing that I put in there. Um, but I also like the darkness of, of playing a role like Kaiba. I, I, I enjoy, I mean that's, as an actor, um, that really forces me to focus. Um, James and Brock come very naturally for me. When I look at the Kaiba stuff, it can be read so many different ways um, because it's not comedy. If it's comedy, to me, we all have a different sense of what's funny. And what's funny is also regional. I might tell you a joke in a certain way that's very New York and you guys are like, what? Right? Um, and you might tell me a joke that's, you know, you know, that's the funniest thing you've ever said up here and, and I'm like, I don't get that. So when I read something funny as Brock and James, I don't ever think about which way I'm going to do it. I do it to the way I think is funny. With Kaiba, to address, am I, okay, I'm angry, but am I sarcastic? Am I, you know, am I true, am I playful? Am I seething? How do I, there's so many different nuances to everything he does, unless he's screaming. Um, <laughs> that that to me, as, as a performer, is a lot of fun because it keeps you on your toes. You've got to really be paying attention rather than like, oh, I know what to do with this James thing here. Give me a second, I got it, you know? Because, you know, Team Rocket stuff is pretty much, uh, you know, I would say very organic of how to play that stuff. You know what I'm saying? <laughs>